All right. Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the world you happen to be. Uh, my name is Christopher Harrison. I'm a, a senior enterprise advocate here at GitHub and super excited for the first of our, actually, no, I take that back. It's our second of our uh, web-based sessions to help you as startups get up and running with GitHub to learn a little bit more about DevOps, to learn a little bit more about what's available to you inside of GitHub. That one of the biggest questions that we wind up getting from people who are like just getting started is really just a what's available? What can I do? What problems can I solve with fill-in technology from GitHub here? And so that's what we hope to answer and hope to help you out with throughout the course of this set of webinars. Uh, today, we're going to be taking a look at two of my favorite features, which are code spaces, which as we're going to see is a fully configurable cloud-based uh, development platform. And Copilot, which is an AI driven pair programmer. Now, before I get into it, there's two things that I want to highlight. Number one is by all means, please, 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 please ask questions. So I'm going to have the chat down here and I'll be keeping an eye on that. So as we go along, please ask questions. I, um, you know, I want to hear from you. I want to be able to answer your questions and help point you in the uh, in the right direction. So by all means, go ahead and ask that. If you see me looking down, that's what I'm looking at is I'm looking at the chat right down here. Um, the second is this is also our first time on the platform. So number one, if everybody could just go ahead and like leave a little message and, and just say, hey, yeah, I can see you. That would be great just to make sure that everybody can um, can can see me. And the second is, okay, that all of that looks good. Also looks like very low latency, which is fantastic. And then the second is I am trying to figure out, can I share my screen? There we go, perfect. Okay, and that works as well. Well then, let me move things around. And without any further ado, let's get on into it. Let's take a look at how you can enhance the developer experience and also increase developer velocity with GitHub Code Spaces and with Copilot. Now, I always like to start basically any presentation that I do with this slide. Uh, as a little bit of background on me, I actually came from Microsoft. I was at Microsoft for about a year, eight years, and I've been at GitHub now for about eight months. And this slide is a little funny to me because that number over there in the eight months that I've been here, I've had to update about like five times, um, which is pretty remarkable. But it just continues to show how GitHub continues to grow and how developers continue to choose GitHub. That yes, there are Fortune 100 companies, or 90% of them, that use GitHub. Yes, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of businesses that use GitHub uh, as well. But you don't reach 100 million developers without developers choosing GitHub. Because at the end of it all, this 100 million is in large part because of individual developers, because of hobbyists choosing GitHub and going, hey, GitHub has the tools that I need. And that really is a big part of our focus here at GitHub, is that we focus in on the developer experience. When we're creating, we're adding on new features, that's what we're focused in on, is how can we help enable and empower developers to do their best work? Now, before I get into Codespaces Copilot, I do want to make sure that I highlight uh, GitHub for Startups. So if you're not already signed up, you're maybe taking a look at it, or not quite sure what's available to you, you can go check out startups.github.com. And in a nutshell, this will give you full access to GitHub Enterprise and up to 20 seats of that for 12 months. That is going to give you enterprise grade DevOps tooling. And so it allows you to start small and continue to grow on into it. 
We're also looking to continue to build and to grow a community. So we're going to be running more sessions like this. We're going to be looking at ways that we can help provide support so that way you can get not only the most out of GitHub, but also get the most out of your startup and help increases the, the, the chances of success. So cool. Um, see a little question applied for it, did not receive it. Um, we can go back and, and double check all of that. Uh, yeah, Garrett's on, on that. Garrett, by the way, runs GitHub for startups and he's going to be in the chat as well, helping to answer questions, which is uh, fantastic. Okay. So let's turn our attention to how we traditionally build software. And normally here's what happens is we bring on a new developer and the new developer is all excited and they get issued that brand new laptop and they're all excited. It's still got that new laptop spell. And now it's time for them to start doing some work. And this is where the bad part comes in because now it's going to be a process of installing all the necessary libraries and installing all the necessary tooling and dealing with all the different version issues and having to search around on Stack Overflow and on Google and on Bing for obscure mess uh, error messages to try and fix things and to get everything properly set up so that way they can actually write that first line of code. That joining on to a new team, that setup process can take hours or days. And this can be really impactful because if I'm looking to bring on a contractor and I want them to be able to quickly contribute, I'm going to lose hours and days right up front of just getting them set up. If we have multiple projects inside of our organization and I want to allow my developers to contribute to multiple projects, they're again going to have to go through that process. That I was talking with one founder who said that he spent 20%, 20% of his time dealing with these types of onboarding issues. That's a lot of lost time and development. So obviously, we need a different approach. We need a better approach. And this is where code spaces comes into play. And so there's a great little quote over here from uh, Airbnb that highlights the way that traditionally we do things, is that traditionally engineers write code on local machines and then eventually synced up to the cloud. And that gives you all of the problems that we just, uh, just mentioned. This is where code spaces comes into play. Now, at the time that this was, was written, code spaces was in beta. It's now, of course, out of beta. And what code spaces gives to us is a fully configurable, cloud-based development environment. It's built on top of containers. So what I can do is I can define a container. I can specify all the different libraries, all the different frameworks, and pin it to the appropriate versions that I'm going to need for my development environment. And if I stop right here and just say, hey, we're going to do things inside of containers. That right there is going to wind up being a win. That I'm a relatively recent convert, maybe about, I don't know, a year ago, into doing container-based development. I'm a big fan of doing container-based development. And so if you've already started down that path and you've already started to configure development containers, that's great. Because now you can actually take advantage of that and just put all of that into the cloud. Additionally, when I'm configuring this, if I'm using Visual Studio Code, I can also specify the extensions that I want as well. Because when we're thinking about writing development, it's not just what libraries and frameworks I have installed, but it's also going to be the collection of extensions as well. Now, all of this is then going to be hosted in the cloud, and I can actually connect to this inside of a browser. And if I do that inside of a browser, I'm going to get Visual Studio Code. 
But if you're using a different IDE, say Visual Studio, say um, IntelliJ, uh, you're going to be able, uh, say JetBrains, you're going to be able to connect up to that remote container from your own local IDE as well. So you can do that inside the browser or you can do that with your own IDE. So how does this work? How do we do all of this? Well, I'm glad that you asked. So over here, I have a little demo that I love to, uh, to, to use, I love to walk through. And this is a Next.js um, uh, application that uses Mongo. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit my little code dropdown right here. And I happen to already have a code space that I created earlier. And I'm gonna go ahead and open that up in a new tab and just get that, that launched. If I wanted to create a new one, I could hit that plus right here. Now, before I go in and take a look at what that code space is gonna look like, I wanna open up this dev container folder, this .dev container folder, and take a look at, at what it is that, that, that we're dealing with here. So this application is going to be using Next.js. So it needs Next.js, it needs React, it needs Node. But it's also going to be using Mongo as the back end. So it not just needs the Mongo API, but it also needs a Mongo server so that way I can do my development. And all of this was built up inside of a Docker Compose file. So what you're going to notice inside of my Docker Compose is the call out to two different containers. So number one is to a container that's defined inside a Docker file, which I'm going to point to in just a minute. And then number two right here is pulling in Mongo. So this is defined just like a normal container. Now, if you're anything like me, and I know I am, chances are when you're doing container work as a developer, you're not always super comfortable about going in and configuring it. That I honestly feel at times that I'm just tricking my container to, uh, to do what I want it to do. And I certainly get that. But what is great, kind of two things here. Number one is if you're using Visual Studio Code, there's a remote container extension. And that's actually how this was built is I use that extension to go, hey, I need a Node.js Mongo container, and it gave one for me right here. Number two is we've also introduced a cool new feature called, well, features, where what I can do is for this dev container is I can say, hey, I also need this, and I also need this, and I also need this, and then it will add that on for me, making it much easier for me to configure that container. The last little item that I want to mention is this dev container JSON file. Because inside of this dev container JSON file, what you're going to notice is there's a list of extensions right here. So this has got ESLint, it's got the MongoDB extension for Visual Studio Code, and inside of here I could list off any other extension that I might want. Let's go take a look at that code space that I opened up. So here it is right here inside of my browser, and it's Visual Studio Code. And you're going to notice a couple of very interesting things here. So number one is if I go over to my um, extensions, and I go to my installed section, let me just collapse a couple of windows here, there we go, is there is a bunch, let me reload that real quick, uh, but there's a bunch of extensions that are installed far more than was listed. And that's because this is Visual Studio Code. So any of the extensions that I've personally installed are going to be synced up to here. The second thing that you might notice is that my little workbench is over here on the right side, which, if you ask me, is where it belongs. The main reason that I like it over here on the right side, let me just open up a, a file, is now when I toggle this on and off, my code doesn't move. I know that seems simple. I know that seems small, but that's to my brain, to, to, to me, really important because what that means is that I'm now not having to shift my eyes. 
So I really like that over there on the right-hand side. I've got that configured inside of my settings, and that is going to be synced up to here. So now when it comes time for any developer to want to do work inside of this project, all that they're going to need to do, let me just uh, boop, 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 go back to the beginning here, is they hit code, they hit new code space, and it will automatically generate that for them. And this code space, at least running inside my browser, this is all that I need. This is now running Visual Studio Code. So I'm going to get everything that I would normally want inside of here. So I'm going to get you know my full IntelliSense. Um, there we go. I get my uh, console log. I get uh, all of my, uh, my extensions, et cetera, all right here. And so this is going to help free me up from having to go through all of the steps necessary to do all of the setup. I just simply go boop, boop, and then I'm done. So there's a question in here from, um, uh, from uh, Jitna. I'm going to start from the top here, um, who says, I uh, check the pricing plan. And let's say two cores, 60 hours a month uh, might not be su uh, sufficient. Wouldn't it get expensive as each developer can spend um, uh, between 320, 640 hours um, in a month? Can I throw some light on? So that's a great question uh, when it comes to um, uh, when it comes to pricing. And there certainly is going to be a um, uh, there's certainly going to be a trade-off here between cloud pricing versus um, you know what it might cost otherwise, and there's two big levels of comparison that I like to point to. Uh, number one is how much it is that you're going to be spending on the laptop that you're going to be issuing to that developer. That if I'm doing all of this inside of the browser, the laptop now that I'm using doesn't need to be near as powerful because all that I need is a browser that if you want to now just develop on a tablet with a keyboard, you're going to be able to do that. So there's a little bit of, of, of a cost savings that you can pick up there. Um, I've even seen memes where people will go in with their uh, their Apple Watch um, and do uh, code spaces development on their Apple Watch. I don't know that I would necessarily recommend that. I mean, I guess you could, but uh, but yeah, you can do that on your Apple Watch. Um, but but that's number one. The number two is you need to also think about the amount of time that's going to be spent for developers switching from project to project, from bringing contractors in, and having contractors then charge you billable hours to go through all of that setup process as well. So as they're moving around, I don't want to lose hours and days to have everybody continuing to go through that setup process. Um, I'd much rather them fire up a code space and go at it from, uh, from, from there. The last little thing that I'm gonna mention is depending on what it is that you're doing, you don't necessarily need as powerful of a machine as we often think that, uh, that, that we do. So a lot of times you can use, especially if you're doing web development, and I'm a web developer at, at, at heart, you can use a relatively low-end code space and be able to do everything that you're looking to do. So there is some level of, of, of trade-off there. Um, but I'm also going to say this, because one thing about me is I'm I'm always going to be honest. I am not here to, to, to sell anybody. I'm not a salesperson. That's not who I am. So I'm also going to say this, is if in your organization, you have a single repository and a single project, and that's what everybody is focused in on, and our team is relatively static, Code spaces then might not be the proper solution for you. That I'm a big believer in in that old saying that if the only tool that you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You need to have multiple tools. So you might look and go, "Hey, we don't necessarily have this problem. We don't necessarily need to use code spaces, and that's fantastic." So if this is not solving a need for you, if it's not filling a gap, then that's okay too. Then, then don't worry too much about code spaces. I think Copilot is going to be really exciting, but we'll get to that in uh, in a minute. So it's a great question. Thank you for for asking that. Um, 
let's see. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Jake here. Uh, if a developer has an extension installed locally and has configured that extension before entering a code space that also has that extension, how are the configurations reconciled? Uh, so that's a great question. And the answer is, it's going to depend. One of the things that Visual Studio Code supports is the ability to sync settings. So I have my list of extensions. I have that synced up to the cloud. It's associated with my GitHub account. And so now if I open up a code space or if I go to a different system and I open up VS Code and I log into it, I'm going to get all of my extensions and I'm going to get all settings that are synced. So assuming that they've turned on that setting sync, they're then going to have access to that. Now, if the extension itself also has some additional settings, whether or not those will sync is going to depend on the extension. So if the extension stores those in the cloud, then it will go along for the ride. And if it doesn't, then they'll have to go back in and update it. So the answer to that question is a little bit, it, uh, it depends. Let's see. Um, uh, Semui asks uh, the question, do I need to reinstall my local extensions before using code spaces? Will my account sync be uh, affected? And I think I just sort of, of, of answered that question, that if you're already syncing the list of extensions, then that will sync up into code spaces as well. Uh, Scott asked the question, do all GitHub developers use code spaces? And the short answer to that question is yes, that uh, as a default setting, if you will, GitHub developers will reach for code spaces first. Now, that is going to vary based on team. That is going to vary a little bit based on the developer. But internally, we do have a culture of like, let's reach for code spaces uh, first. And I will say that for my own development, the, the, the projects that I wind up contributing to, I'm basically always inside of, uh, of, of code spaces. Um, how suitable are code spaces for uh, legacy development? Um, are there limitations on what can be dev containerized? Uh, is the question from uh, from Renat. So that's a great question. I need to go back and double check. I can never rem I. I Garrett, I, I, if, if, if you're listening, maybe you know the answer to this question. I cannot remember off the top of my head if Codespaces supports GPU or not. Um, I, 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 that's either in development or um, it's not there yet, one or the other. Um, but, um, uh, but when you're taking a look at maybe like GPU access and doing like ML and so forth, you might decide, hey, you know what? I need more processing power. And so at that point, you might decide to do that something, uh, do something like that locally. Uh, number two, when it comes to legacy code, it's going to depend on the legacy code. So if I'm just writing like COBOL, let's say, that's going to be fine. But if I'm doing something, maybe I'm doing like VB6 and I'm doing uh, Windows development, then in that type of a situation, I might either need to use the code space in the cloud and connect to that with Visual Studio, or I might have to do that locally. So the answer to that is going to depend quite a bit on what it is that, uh, uh, that, that, that you're doing. So I know that's not necessarily the best answer, but that's about the best that I can, uh, uh, I, I, I can give you there. Um, cool. Let's see. Uh, and there are a few questions over in the Q&A as, as well. I'll go over and look at that in a second. Uh, the other question, can I uh, use your own host for dev containers? Um, think uh, self-hosted runners for actions. Um, yes and no. So the concept of a dev container has been around for the last couple of years now where people will create a container and do development on that. And you can absolutely uh, do that uh, do that locally. And before I came over to Codespaces, that was honestly the way that I was doing that. The, the way that VS Code supports that, VS Code is my editor of choice, is you create this .dev container uh, folder, and then you define what your container looks like right there. And then you can do all of that locally. And that's part of the reason why I like code spaces is because now all of this just goes up to the cloud and now it just runs inside the cloud. So can you do that locally? Uh, and the answer is, um, uh, is yes. 
So cool. All right, let me kick over to the Q&A here. Uh, let's take a look. Uh, may have already been addressed, but any issues syncing extensions? We talked about that. Thank you, Dustin. Um, another one, what CPU architecture are these machines based on? Is it x86 or ARM? I want to say that it's x86, uh, but I'd have to go back and, and double check um, on that. So um, uh, that's a great question, Janice. Uh, I'll, um, uh, we can get back to you on, uh, on that one. Um, seeing quite a lot of performance issues running dev on the M1 Max into their arm. Yeah, I want to say that uh, that dev containers running up in the cloud is going to be uh, x86. Another question, um, can you SSH into these containers as well? Uh, the answer to that is, ah, so glad you asked that question. Thank you for asking that question. So the question is, can you SSH into that container? And the short answer on SSH is, no, but so right here, I've got a web application. And if you're doing anything inside of a web application, there's going to be command line commands that you're going to need to, uh, to run. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up the terminal window here inside of VS Code, uh, which is command and then the uh, back tick. And right here is my terminal window. And you'll notice this is running right here inside of the container. So if I do like an NPM install like this, it will now go ahead and run that inside the container. Or if I say NPM uh, run dev like this, it will now go ahead and run that inside the container. Now this brings up another great question, which is, well, hang on a minute. If this is now running inside of that dev container, how am I going to be able to access this? And that is a fantastic question. And if I come right down here, what you're going to notice, I've got a little spot that says forwarded ports. I'm going to click on that. And now let me right click on this and let's say open in browser. And now this is going to connect to my forwarded port. And do to do. And now I am right here through my browser connected up to this. Now this is set up as a private environment. And so it's only going to give me access if I have authenticated. So if somebody actually figured out what that uh, value is and typed all of that into their browsers, they're watching this, they're not going to be able to see this. So SSH, no, but because of the fact that I'm connected this way, I'm able to connect just as I normally would. And then we also have this concept of forwarded ports. So now I can still interact with this application, even though I'm working locally and this is running up in the uh, running up in the cloud. So yeah, so great question. I'm so glad you asked that. It was a part of the demo I wanted to get to. So that worked perfectly. Okay, and let's see. Let me go back over here to the chat, see if there was anything else. Um, thank you for pasting in the link, Carrot. That's great. And um, currently, let our customers with their own uh, customer integrations using Monaco get to this, this Monaco editor in order to give the best experience. Is there any way we can integrate the code space SDK with our platform? Yeah, I don't. I don't have the answer to um, to that question, unfortunately. Yeah, that I don't know the answer to. I'd have to get back to you on that. Um, and then Fabio asked the question very uh, at the very bottom, very similar to how web containers works. Yes, yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, cool. So. There is dev containers. I also want to mention, um, you know, this is fully interactive. So, like, I can go in, add in a pet. Let me go to my README because I have a, a URL that I can paste in here. Do, do, do. Boop. And then, um, so uh, Sammy, Christopher, Amstaff, um, she is four, um, potty trained. And then let's just paste in. Oh. Um, Pascal. And I think I've got everything. Let me hit submit. And then voila. So there is, is Roscoe. And then just fully uh, fully integrated right there into my browser. So 
I'm able to uh, interact with that container. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. All right. So that is code spaces. There is my demo. Um, what sort of latency hits do you see when working on medium large projects, uh, multiple projects in a single browser? That's going to really just depend on uh, how big of a code space you're using and of course how complex your project is. So there isn't necessarily going to be like a definitive answer that I can give you, but as like with anything, the more processing power that you're going to ask for from it, the bigger of a machine uh, that you're going to have to give to it. So cool. All right. Um, how's the support for mono repo and multiple projects? So great question. Uh, so the question is um, for mono repo, uh, it works really, really well. That when this was initially built, it was initially built for mono repo. For multiple projects, that support is continuing to increase and improve. Uh, I am going to be honest in saying that. It does take a little bit of extra configuration if you need to actually bring together like two, three repositories for a single project, but it is supported and we are looking to continue to streamline and increase support for that. So great question. All right. Let's take a look at Copilot. There's a limit to abstraction. Developers today have access to more frameworks than we know what to do with. That I think in the half hour that I've been talking, there's probably been 15 new JavaScript frameworks uh, that have launched. And if I'm exaggerating at all, that's probably too low of a number at 15, he says with a big smile. And where that leads us to is kind of two challenges. Number one is it's tough for developers to keep pace with everything. And especially if I'm maybe moving from project to project where maybe we're using a couple of different frameworks, maybe I'm using Vue over here and I'm using React over here, I then have to stop and remember, okay, well, what's the syntax? What's the, the ceremony that needs to be done over here? And that, that can get really uh, uh, become a pain in the butt. But the other very big thing that the, all of these frameworks wind up introducing is some level of boilerplate code where I'm constantly having to go back and like copy and paste from somewhere else. And copying and pasting code is a fantastic way to duplicate bugs across your code base. It's not something that I really want to do. It's, it's tedious. It's boring. It's error prone. We need a better solution. And this is where a tool like Copilot comes into play because it's going to help me overcome the clunky ways that we as developers wind up writing code. We talked already about copy paste. Every single developer uses Stack Overflow. That going to Stack Overflow is so much of a meme, the meme itself has become a meme. And the problem is, is that when you go over to Stack Overflow, that's going to take you out of the flow because I'm now leaving my IDE. I'm having to figure out how to craft the query. And then when I find the answer, I'm copying and pasting that over, but now I'm having to modify that so it works for my specific environment in my specific scenario. And then we also wind up just losing cycles from developers trying to remember or having to go look up how to do tasks that are not infrequent, but not frequent enough where they necessarily know how to do that off the top of their head with like a regular expression being a perfect example. So we need <laughs> stuff security. I'm going to get to that in a second. Um, so we need something that's going to help us out. And this is where Copilot comes into play. Copilot is 
an AI-driven pair programmer that what Copilot will do is it will look at your context. It will look at what it is that you are writing. It will look at what it is that you're doing. And then it will automatically make suggestions for your code from there. And it can do this by looking at your comments and then turning that into code or looking at the code that you're writing and then making suggestions based on the code that it sees you actually typing in. Now, there's a um, uh, a question that's said in jest um, from, from Jitten about uh, this is being job security. And that's a great question. And my answer to that is even in today's world, regardless of where we are in, in, in the, ah, um, sorry about that, uh, regardless of where we are in, in the economy, there's still far more development that needs to be done than we have developers to actually do. And copying and pasting code isn't really writing code. That let me, I want this slide right here. We have a little bit of survey data that when Copilot is enabled, 75% of developers feel more fulfilled in their job because nobody writes, nobody likes copying and pasting code. Nobody likes just doing mundane tasks. It's not why we became developers. It's not what attracted us to this field. And with Copilot, what we're going to see is that it's going to take care of that mundane stuff for me. It's going to take care of a lot of that stuff that I need to look up. So that way I can actually focus on solving the problems that I was hired to solve. I can focus on solving the problems that are exciting. It makes my job more interesting. Okay. Um, so the question is, is, is GitHub included in um, uh, GitHub for Enterprise or uh, in, in GitHub for Startups? And the short answer to that question is no. However, GitHub for Enterprise is uh, $19 per developer. And let's talk about $19 per developer per month. Let's just kind of talk about that for, for a second. And think about the salaries for the developers that you are currently paying. So $19 per month, think about the salaries that you're paying. Just keep those two values in mind. And I'm going to get to this slide right here. We did a study. We took 95 developers, split them up into two different groups. 45 of them had access to Copilot, 50 didn't. 78% with Copilot finished the task of writing a web server in JavaScript. 70% finished it without Copilot. And looking at those numbers, if you wanted to argue 45, 50, 70%, 78%, that that's within the margin of error, agreed, 100%. I'm going to agree with you. Because two, three developers on either side there, and those numbers now become very, very different. Okay. Let's take a look at that bottom number, though. Without Copilot, on average, two hours, 41 minutes. With Copilot, one hour, 11 minutes an hour and a half difference, $19 a month, an hour and a half difference, just sort of using this as our example. I don't necessarily know exactly what it is that anybody who's tuned in is paying their developers, but for an hour and a half, something tells me you're probably paying them a little bit more than $19. And that's only for a month. So cost benefit here, $19 a month, I personally, this is my own personal opinion, think that that's absolutely uh, absolutely worth that. Um, and every single person and customer that I've talked to um, absolutely sees that, uh, that value there. So it's a great question, but again, like that cost benefit uh, that we're going to, um, uh, to, to, to get from there. So yeah, and so Ariane also highlights um, that uh, they are looking to include uh, more products. So do stay tuned, do stay tuned. Okay, so let's take a look at Copilot. I got about 20 minutes here. All right, I want to get rid of that. Let's come over here. All right, so 
I'm using React here. I could be using any framework. I happen to be using React. I'm going to confess something. I'm not a React fan. I honestly don't like React. Like I said earlier, I'm a web developer at heart. I love Svelte. Svelte is my jam. That is a longtime web developer. Writing Svelte code feels very natural to me. But if you go look at the most popular frameworks, it's React, it's Vue, it's Angular, and then it's Svelte somewhere down here. So as much as I might love it, I don't necessarily get a whole lot of opportunity to write it because there's just not a whole lot of organizations out there that are using Svelte. There's a lot of organizations that are using React. And what that also in turn means is that I'm always having to stop and remember how to do things in React because unless you are really well-versed in React, there are things that don't always feel natural, that, it, 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 that, that there are specific things in, in React syntax that can feel a little bit awkward if you're not overly uh, accustomed to it. And this is where I really, really like Copilot, because I can then lean on Copilot to help guide me through all of those things. And then again, I can now focus in on uh, on, on on all of that. Can we start a framework war here? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, no. All right. So um, uh, tabs versus spaces. Uh, by the way, it is hard G GIF. Chief among the hills that I will die on. Hard G, GIF. All right. Anyway, uh, let me go ahead and just uh, through comments, uh, let me say um, import React. And then now we'll go ahead and import React. And then now let me say uh, create a function uh, component. And then now let's go ahead and let that do its thing. And I don't necessarily want the, uh, the hello world there. So I'm just going to get rid of that. Now, as I'm going along here, there's a couple of things that I want you to notice is every time that I type out a comment or I type out some bit of code and I go on to the next line here, that you're noticing that little bit of gray italicized text, that's Copilot in action. And just as if I was using IntelliSense, if I see what I like, all that I have to do is hit tab and accept that code. That code now becomes my code. So I can choose to accept what it gives me. I can also go back and decide to change what it gives me as well. So it's now giving me a hello world here. That's not really what I want. I just want to close this out. So I'm just going to do that. And then I come down here and now you'll notice it's actually making suggestions on the next comment. So when I create a component inside of React, one of the very common things that I need to do is export that. It goes, hey, you're creating a component. Let me go ahead and export that. And so now... There I go. So right now I've generated, uh, we'll just take out the white space here, uh, say seven lines of code. And all I've had to type is two lines of comments. I haven't actually written any code yet. It did all, all the rest of that for me. So my little welcome component, uh, what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to uh, grab a name and then check to see whether or not we have the name. And if not, we'll display a form to prompt you for the name. So let's create a state object for the name. Um, create state object for name, hit enter, and now it does this. Now it's giving me a default value. Uh, John, I don't want a default value, so I'm just going to get rid of that. Again, this is my code. So I can go in and modify that as needed. Now if I maybe wanted to load this from an API, let's just Kind of, I, I'm going to do this as a real quick aside here. I'm going to uh, delete this in a second. But let's say I maybe wanted to load the name from an API. So I'm going to say load name from um, API um, at WAC API WAC name. Let's just do that. So it's going to give me this little use effect here. Hit tab, and then hit tab, and then hit tab to close that out. This is really cool. One of the challenges that I have with React is how React deals with asynchronous code. 
because unfortunately, in order for things to work um, asynchronously on page load, you have to do this really funny thing with use effect where you um, tell it to look for a change, but just not put a filter on it. And so what this inherently winds up doing is it will do it when the component loads, but not in any other time. And I know this from having done enough React so that when I see it, I know that it's correct. But it's one of those where unless you've done React, you're never going to be able to come up with that on your own. Copilot did that for me. That's what I really love about Copilot is that it's going to do its best to follow along with best practices and it's going to help my developers then um, uh, not have to focus in on, on things like that. Now, let's also say this is like that's using then statements. I'm I personally prefer to use async await. So I can always just come back to the comment and tell it to do it differently. So I can say um, load API from uh, API name uh, using async um, uh, await. And ah, let's see, let me, there we go. And then will you do the, okay. Um, uh, load name on component mount. We'll just do that as a, a second comment here. There we go, like that. And I could go back to the comment up here and sort of maybe tell uh, again what it is that I want. And what I'm really trying to demo with this part right here is when you're working with Copilot, it is a lot like you're working with a pair programmer. And so you wind up talking to it. And let's be honest, every single developer in the world talks to their computer. It's what we do, right? So I'm, I'm now talking to my computer and it's doing what I want it to do. I'm just talking to it through comments right here. So I didn't quite get what I want. So I just go back and I rephrase my question and it will now take another shot at that. And again, like that's kind of what I really like is if I don't see what I like the first time, I can go back to React and I can maybe be a little bit more specific and then um, uh, get that back. Um, Scott brings up a, a point here. Um, code consistent is uh, pretty important to project maintainability. How well does Copilot do it suggesting code that follows the patterns already established in the project? Um, uh, both good patterns and, and bad patterns. Uh, that's a great question. And the answer is it does remarkably well. I would score it about an eight out of 10. That as I'm writing my code here, this will automatically be sending up context to uh, Copilot and running things based off of that. So in my example here, like I explicitly told it to use async await. But if I had another function up here um, that uh, had already been using async await, then it would have written this the first time as async await rather than using then statement. So it will follow along with what it sees um, both good and bad. So if somebody is using bad practices, Copilot is going to follow along with those bad practices as well. So it does a pretty good job of that. Um, it's not able to look at like your entire project, but it is able to typically glean enough context from what it sees to be able to follow along with that. So yeah, there's a, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so yeah. Um, uh, Janice asked a question, can you force it to adhere to a specific type of architecture? So for example, um, suggest to use value objects, not just throw uh, code directly into the class that you're in. Absolutely. Yeah. So two things on that. Number one is if that's what you're already doing, then Copilot will typically pick that up and start doing that as well. But number two is if it's not doing what you want it to do, then you can go back and tell it to do what you want it to do. So uh, yes. Okay, I'm gonna kick over to the Q&A, um, see if there's anything else in here. Um, best way to have Copilot write unit tests from, from Jason? That's a great question. And the short answer to that question is do it just like you were writing code here. So let me, uh, let me go into Cypress and let's go to my end to end. I'm just gonna go into here and Let's um, let's do this. Is 
Zhu, um, let's say um, uh, index page should display form with button of ID um, submit. Sure, like that. Cool. There's my unit test. So just like I, just like I wrote out my my normal code, unit tester code, just like that. So just describe what you want and away you go. Um, let's see. Uh, will Copilot use the code that humans write as training data for other Copilot users outside of your organization? Uh, so uh, that's a great question, Mike. It depends on the version of Copilot that you're using. So if you're using Copilot for business, the answer to that question is no, that none of the code that you use is used to retrain the model. So Copilot for business, the answer to that is 100% no. If you're an individual, you actually have control over that setting if you want to turn that on or turn that off. Uh, but for Copilot for Business, the answer to that question is no. But I also want to make sure that I highlight this part here is I mentioned already that information needs to be sent to Copilot in order for it to make the suggestions. All of that is ephemeral, which is just a very fancy word uh, way of saying that it's temporary. So none of that is going to be stored. So it's going to be sent up, used to make the suggestion, and then it goes away from, uh, from there. And then uh, Lucas asked the question, do I find Copilot more helpful uh, for more popular languages and frameworks? Is there a way that you can coax Copilot to make suggestions for the lesser or newer languages or frameworks? So Copilot has been trained on billions and billions of lines of publicly available code. And its language support is going to be based on how much of that it's seen. So it's going to be able to do really, really well on JavaScript. It's going to be able to do really, really well on Java. It's going to be able to do really, really well on Python. It's COBOL support, for example. Um, and I want to make sure that I stress this point right here. I, I, this part right here is just me conjecturing. Um, it's COBOL support is not going to necessarily be quite as good because, and again, this is me conjecturing, I'm, I'm making an assumption here that it probably just hasn't seen as much COBOL code. So it's, it's going to vary a little bit from language to language based on what it's seen, but for the most common languages, frameworks, et cetera, that you're using, you're going to notice that support is going to be just fine. And I would also highlight, you know, even if you're using a, a less popular framework like like Svelte, it hurts me to say that, uh, Copilot is actually still going to have pretty good support uh, for that as well. So yeah, uh, great question. Um, Jim asked the question, is code review integrated uh, in with Copilot? Short answer is no. And this actually brings up another very important point. Copilot is not going to write perfect code. That's not the design. It'd be high near impossible to write a tool like that. So Copilot is a tool, just like copying and pasting is a tool, just like going to Stack Overflow is, is, is a tool. All of those are, are, are tools. Yes, some of them are better than others, but all of those are tools. So you still want to make sure that you're using a linter. You still want to make sure that you're using code quality checks. You still want to make sure that you're using security checks. Like all of that still becomes very important because at the end of the day, this is your code and you want to treat it like any other code that you have inside of your organization. So great question. All of these have been great questions. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, is code review integrated? Is, is that? Uh, can it suggest abstractions like generate a new file with a helper class? Scott asks. Um, so it's it's not able to. I'm trying to figure out how I want to ref, uh, how I want to phrase this. The answer is sort of yes and no. So let's let's say I did this. Um, let me um, 
let me get back to like here. Um, ah. Okay. Doing this live, this might not actually work. We're going to find out. I think I can do something like this though in Copilot. And again, this might not work. I'm, I'm. This is literally the first time that I'm uh, that I'm doing this. Um, let me see. Uh, rewrite uh, the above to be a function. Do that. Okay. So, sort of. So what you're going to notice is it rewrote it. it it, it knows that if it just wrote that into there, that's going to cause problems. So it will give that to me as a comment here. And now I could take that and copy and paste that elsewhere um, and then do from that. So it can help suggest some level of rewrites, um, but it's not necessarily going to be able to like do true refactoring. So like if you're using um, like some of the JetBrains plugins um, and even Visual, Visual Studio Code has some level of support for this where I can go, hey, take this class and put this into another file. Copilot isn't going to be able to do something like that. It can like help make suggestions like this, but it's not going to be able to go the rest of the way for that. It's, it's just not built for, for something like that. Okay, um, um, I love seeing the wow. Um, what's the difference between Copilot for business and Copilot for individuals? Um, there's a couple of very big differences. So number one is, like I mentioned before, is the um, uh, is your code being used for retraining? So Copilot for business, the answer is going to be one hundred percent no. Um, the second big thing is that you're going to have access to admin tools. So I can now better control who has access to Copilot and doesn't have access to Copilot. And right now you can do that on an organization by organization basis. And the other part that I'm going to say is stay tuned, uh, that there are other enhancements that you're going to be seeing for Copilot for Business that are going to be announced at some point in the future. I think that was generic enough. Um, but, uh, but yes, but the, the two primary differences is admin controls and the fact that again, with Copilot for business, your code is never used, uh, to retrain the, um, uh, is retrain the model. So, uh, Scott asked the question, how, um, well does it do with bringing in, uh, dependencies? Does it suggest bringing in a library? It does not suggest bringing in a library unless you've already made a um, a reference to that. So inside my package, Jason, um, I've got uh, Mongoose, uh, I've got React, etc. But let's say I wasn't using Mongoose. Let's let's just say like I didn't have um, uh, I didn't have Mongoose. If I was doing something, it's never going to suggest that I use Mongo. So it's not going to make suggestions of libraries that I'm already using. And this right here is my own personal opinion. Um, I, I don't know that it ever would because it would really sort of put Copilot in a funny position because like, let's use web frameworks as, as an example, you know, Svelte, React, Angular, et cetera. If it starts making suggestions on, on frameworks, that's really going to start pointing people in a different way. And that's not really what Copilot wants to do. So if you've already got the library, it will make suggestions based on, on that. If I'm writing code and I maybe say something like, use an API and somewhere in the past it's learned that there's a particular like URL or URL path, that could be helpful. Like it might suggest something like that, but as far as suggesting a library goes, the answer to that is is uh, is no. So great question. Okay, got about a minute left here. I love talking about this stuff. Okay, so that is Copilot. The primary takeaway that I want you to get out of Copilot is what Copilot will do for me is it will not only take my comments convert that into code, and not only look at the code that I'm writing and make suggestions based on that, but it will really help enhance my developers' lives because it's going to take away a lot of the nitty gritty of writing code away from them. 
And it's going to allow them to focus in on the higher level problems, the tougher problems, quite frankly, the real problems that we've hired them to solve. So rather than copying and pasting, rather than having to look up syntax, I can stay right here in my editor. I can write my code. If I'm not sure about something, I can just ask Copilot with a comment. And Copilot will then generate suggestions that I can now use. So where do we go from here? Well, if you haven't already done so, I cannot strongly suggest this enough, sign up for Copilot. I also do want to mention that Copilot for Individuals does have a trial, a free trial as well, that you can check out. So that way, if you're you know, not entirely sure about what it is that Copilot can do, yes, you do have to put in a credit card. So you'll have to just remember to go back and cancel. But there is a free trial for Copilot for Individuals that is available. I definitely, definitely, definitely recommend checking that out. And then for code spaces, where this is again really going to shine is on that shared repos, uh, 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 repos. If you are bringing in contractors, new developers, code spaces can really help with that onboarding and make that work uh, so much faster. So if you haven't already done so, startups.github.com. Keep an eye out on LinkedIn. Uh, as we are going to continue to be uh, doing these, we're also going to be running uh, office hours as well. So if you have questions about, well, anything, DevOps, GitHub, et cetera, you can hop on in, ask those, uh, ask those questions. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm at Geek Trainer. Um, you can find me on GitHub as well, Geek Trainer. Um, please do reach out. Uh, we're looking to continue to build the community. If you found this helpful, please let us know if there are particular topics that you want to see. Please let us know. We're here for you, not the other way around. We want to learn and grow. Uh, and the best way that we can do that is Give us your feedback. Give us your thoughts. If there's specific things that you want to see, let us know, and we'll do our best to get those in there. Thank you again to everybody for tuning in, and I will see you again in the not-too-distant future. Thank you. Bye.